committee will come to order. Good morning, members. I hope everybody had a wonderful break. I certainly did. It was great to get away, and now we can stay buckled up in our chairs for the rest of the day and be refreshed by the end of the day, right? Kind of like that, Senator Champion? Sort of. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I do believe, for the record, we do have a quorum. Uh, members, we do have a very long day today. This audio is kind of strange, isn't it? It must be new. Yeah, thank you. And first up, we have uh, Senator Swazinski's Menstrual Product Access, Senate File 3052 before us. So good morning, Senator. Good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair and members. Before we begin, I have the A4. It's a technical amendment the, um, that will be adding the appropriate language. Senator Marty? I'll move the A4. Senator Marty moves the A4 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Thank you again, Madam Chair and members. The bill before you requires that all schools provide students in grades 4 through 12 access to no-cost menstrual products in our um, school bathrooms. This is a classic how a bill becomes a law 101. About, uh, two or three years ago, a number of high school students met with me, and they brought this to my attention that menstrual products are not provided for along with toilet paper and paper towels and hand soap, and they just wanted to know why is that. And they told me all these examples and anecdotes that of experiences that they had where they ended up missing school because they didn't have access to menstrual products and other examples. And then since then, I've met with all the nurses in the middle schools and high schools of my, um, of my district, and they had anecdote after anecdote after anecdote of kids missing class, of kids having to go home from school because they um, didn't have menstrual products, or that the machine at the high school that provided them was busted. Or, um, and then, so one day I was walking out of one of my school um, after talking to students about this bill and other bills that, of interest to them, and um, I saw a secretary that I had worked with for years, and I just asked, she asked what I was doing in the building. I told her about some bills I'm working on. I brought up this bill, and she said, yesterday, a girl came in here, and she had bled through her pants, and she asked if I could borrow my sweater. And, of course, I, I gave it to her, and that's how she finished the school day, wearing a secretary, secretary uh, uh, sweater because she didn't have access to product in, her, in the school. Um, I found out that um, the, the teachers that I worked with for over 30 years, it was common practice. I don't know why I never figured this out, but um, many of my colleagues had tampons in their desk drawers that they paid for out of their pocket for when kids needed it, and the kids knew which um, teachers to go to because they knew that they, it would be um, non-judgmental and they would be able to go to the bathroom and, and um, um, and here's where I get um, a little red-faced on this particular topic. But anyways, um, their bill has two different names as it's been go navigating through the, the pipeline, and period poverty and menstrual equity, and I think both titles speak for themselves. I didn't even know that if you're on SNAP, um, um, uh, uh, nutritional program, SNAP does not pay for menstrual products. Um, it'll only provide food. And so if you are in need of menstrual products and the, your school doesn't provide them, um, Kids are missing school. They stay at home. I didn't even realize until I started researching this all the anecdotes that my wife and my daughter ended up sharing with me from when they were kids. And um, I wasn't willing to ask my mother if she had a similar um, stories to share. But anyways, let's remove this barrier. Let's let girls be girls and not have to think about, um, oh my God, I'm, I'm getting my period and I wasn't prepared or whatever may be the case. And um, so anyway. Anyways, that's my opening testimony. I'd love to hear your questions. I have um, Jenna Hoffer alongside of me to answer any of the technical um, questions about the operating capital aid or, or the op capital operating level, levy um, and things like that that she's an expert on. So thank you again, Madam Chair and committee me members for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Swazinski. Ms. Hofer, can you please um, explain how the the adjustment on the per pupil will happen. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Yes, so the operative language is going to be on page two of the bill. Uh, so sections two and three are going to adjust the operating capital revenue funding stream. Uh, so you'll see in section two on line uh, 10, it adds $2 per adjusted pupil unit uh, to the operating capital revenue of each school district. Uh, so that will be all aid because in section three of the bill down on line 2.26, uh, it adjust, adjusts the equalization factor to ensure that on a statewide basis, operating capital levies do not increase. Uh, so as a result of those two sections, uh, the total appropriation increase in the bill is $1,737,000 in fiscal year 2023. $1,924,000 in fiscal year 2024, and $1,891,000 in fiscal year 2025, and there's no increase to state levies. No, we will model this in the house. It's not in the house. Okay. I don't think so. Ms. Hofer, was there a fiscal note on this? And how did you come to, or how did, how did the $2 uh, adjusted pup pupil unit come to be? Uh, thank you for the question, Madam Chair. Uh, so there was not a fiscal note on this bill because our staff, uh, Ms. Jelseth, has the capability and the data to model the impact of the operating capital revenue. Uh, so she has the, the pupil units needed and then the cost of the bill, and she's able to input that into uh, a fancy model and get the, the cost statewide. And so um, I believe the $2 was um, suggested by the advocates to cover the cost of the, the product on a statewide basis. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, um, Ms. Hover, it seems a little expensive. Can you go through the, uh, the appropriation sheet that we all have before us? Uh, sure. So, Madam Chair, um, so the, uh, the appropriation oh, spreadsheet is actually for the um, omnibus bill, yes. um, but uh, the same language is carried in the omnibus bill. So as a result, um, members, if you do have the, the state aid spreadsheet in front of you that shows the change items on line 12, you'll see um, the operating capital increase for the menstrual products in schools. And so you'll see in fiscal year 2023, there's an increase of $1,737,000. In fiscal year 2024, there's an increase of $1,924,000. And then in fiscal year 2025, there's an increase of $1,891,000. Okay. Any questions, members? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator, you mentioned uh, machines that, that, that did not operate or didn't work. I'm assuming that there are some schools now that are doing or supplying this? I know of one, Senators, oh, excuse me, Madam okay. Chair. Yeah, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I know of one um, oh, okay. that is doing it. But the, when I said the machines are broken, I meant, um, and again, I don't really know that much about this, but you know, machines that take the, a nickel or a quarter or whatever the cost may be, and those tend to be not operating or they're broken or they're not full or filled. Okay. Is what I've been to, told. To that point, Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, on line 22, 21 and 22 of the first page, Senator Swinsitzky, um, the products must be available in the rest, restrooms used by the grades 4 through 12. Um, vandalism, abuse. There's been um, studies, um, I think it was Apple Valley or Lakeville, I apologize, it was a, a high school district down there that did an experimental program where they just had the tampons available in a basket um, by the sinks and there was no abuse of the opportunity of free tampons when needed and they, the, at the end of the day they, the baskets were still full or one or two missing um, and I, I think the mil, 1.9 million dollars is kind of a a deal um, because this is just for emergencies. Most girls, I'm guessing, speculating that they're going to provide for their own products. This is just for those times when um, emergencies happen. And so, two million dollars it comes out to be um, less than a million dollars per student, um, male and female. Mm -hmm. Okay. No further questions? Senator, closing comments? No, just thank you for hearing my bill, Commissioner. Or, um, um, uh, whatever you want to call me. That's fine. <laughs> um, I want to call you um, really Chair actually. Rosen is what <laughs> I want to call you. <laughs> that 
works. I don't know why that came out of my head. It's <laughs> early and we have had a wonderful week off. So thank you members for hearing the bill and I think it's the right thing to do for all of our female students that um, maybe had, are having a bad day already and all of a sudden they realize there's, um, what they need isn't available in their purse. And, and for a fourth or fifth and sixth grade girl to have to go to the nurse's office um, just maybe isn't um, the right thing to do, and so um, just providing for these in the bathrooms just seems like something that we should have been done um, years ago. And so, thank you, Madam well, Chair. Thank you, Senator uh, Senator Kent. Before we thank about. you, Madam Chair, and I'm sorry I'd stepped away briefly, and the, suddenly we're wrapping up. So I apologize for the lateness of my comment here. But um, Senator Swidzinski, thank you for carrying this bill. This is one of those I've had constituents come to me really strongly supporting this this bill, um, and it, in those conversations, uh, everybody sort of says, "Wow." You know, it makes total sense that this is a problem and this is a solution that we can provide. Um, and uh, why didn't we think of this sooner? Uh, so thank you for, for leading this here. And Madam Chair, I appreciate our conversation about this bill as well, because I know a lot of us are hearing from folks in our communities about what a difference this would make uh, for their kids. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Kent. Senator Swazinski, you were very brave to take this bill on too. <laughs> So I wish I could tell you how many times my face was um, red. <laughs> you did great. Senator Marty. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. I'll move Senate File 3052. As, As amended, amended. Be recommended pass and placed on general orders. Members, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The bill does pass. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator and members. Next up, we have Senator Chamberlain. Still waiting for those apple fritters, Senator Chamberlain. I, I, I don't know. Grandma's Just waiting patiently. Grandma's bakery. I should have brought <laughs> Maplewood Bakery. I hear it's the best. <laughs> Where's your sense of humor, Senator Chamberlain? <laughs> Still in Texas where okay. it was last week. Okay, very good. We'll get the hang of it. We're, we're um, getting our cadence here. <laughs> Senator Chamberlain, Senate File 4113, or Omnibus <laughs> Education Bill. So, uh, Madam Chair, first I'll give a brief explanation of the bill, and then uh, we do have one amendment, I believe, uh, for the bill. So this is a literacy omnibus appropriations bill. There's a lot of challenges in all areas of government and the state and society and culture. With K-12 specifically, there's a lot of issues and challenges. Um, uh, K-12 was funded uh, last year, almost record funding, uh, biggest, most funding in 15 years, 6% increase plus uh, total, plus the formula increase, which was significant, and the largest in about 15 years. And we held off on all the mandates. It was a good, tight bill. Uh, everybody was happy with it. The governor was happy with it. So this year we're focusing on a core foundational problem in our educational system and that's literacy. This omnibus bill uh, has five parts to it, five different pieces of legislation, all addressing literacy. Uh, the first part has to do with world's best workforce. As you may recall, back in 2013, a large bill was passed, uh, created a, a heavy mandate on schools for a lot of reporting and preparation. Uh, they have found that they the schools really don't like this because it hasn't resulted, has not equated into results. Uh, so what we decided to do is suspend it uh, for some time and let the schools focus simply on reading. Now there are some things in this that still are required, but a lot of that they're already doing. We just kind of reorder that. The schools are still required to give the MCAs to the students uh, as uh, required by state uh, federal law. But this is a suspension of a heavy mandate, a heavy burden, might chew up one to two FTEs in, uh, easily in these districts across the state and it really has not uh, improved reading. In your packets you have 
a chart that shows uh, Minnesota MCA scores for third grade, I believe it's third grade reading proficiency. And you see how there's been no improvement or a steady decline over the years. The NAEP scores are also in your packets, I believe. And you can see how we compare to Mississippi and we are uh, trailing them as well, especially in the uh, minority groups. Uh, children of color are still lagging and not improving in the state of Minnesota. So again, back to literacy. Suspending world's best workforce, it's a mandate relief, focused solely on literacy. Uh, second, we uh, regional centers of excellence designed to provide extra support to the schools across the state through the region, uh, uh, regional centers, uh, specifically in literacy, uh, in various areas, uh, um, various areas of literacy for uh, of support for schools across the state, um, and also promoting the letters program and helping the department through that process. Um, three, one simple little change. Uh, I believe it's still section five, perhaps. Uh, we strike the word balanced from the um, statute. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but balance implies to the educators in districts that, that um, they have to teach whole language. Whole language is not the way to teach literacy. That has been proven with the negative results that we have in this state. Number four, reading strategies. Let me see if, um, oh, this says Pelsby. Now we found this year in our work, uh, superintendents and educators have been, superintendents and educators have been coming to us for a couple of years saying, um, well, you know, I never got that in prep, college prep. Superintendents came to us this year. So we never got uh, science of reading uh, in, in college. Our, we, have, we have teachers that don't know how to teach reading. No fault of the teachers, mind you. They thought they were getting what they were paying for, but they didn't. Pelsby, I will say in front of all of you, has not been doing their job. And prior to Pelsby, the teacher licensing board has not been doing their job. 10 years ago, we've had a statute longer than 10 years, Senator Olson and others, put into statute that the prep schools, college prep had to teach science or reading. They didn't. I was gonna get a lot of higher eds upset at me, but Truth is truth, because a lot, of, a lot of educators are shortchanged. So in statute, it says they have to have it. Apparently, that wasn't clear enough. So we went ahead and said, all right, we're going to require that uh, these prep schools teach letters. Teach them clearly. Put it in there. That's what the teachers need. That's what those prospective um, elementary ed teachers need. And finally, um, the biggest part and most important part is the letters uh, f for uh, letters training for educators. Uh, as I said earlier, educators thought they were getting something and they weren't. So uh, last year, the first time we were able to do this, we uh, budgeted money for letters training for educators. We didn't mandate anything. We put money out there allowing educators to take this at their leisure. They gobbled it up. And they, the feedback has been extremely positive. They love it. They see results in the classroom. Members, this literacy bill, this part of the bill is vitally important. It gives the educators what they need without a mandate, what they've wanted. This is bipartisan stuff over the years that we've built into this bill. Bipartisan and it focuses on the most important thing that kids need in school, and that's reading. So this $30 million is for uh, letters, so all K through five educators, elementary ed can get letters training. As I said, we've received a lot of positive feedback from uh, educators. They, they see results right away. Um, it has been supported by them. It's not a mandate. They can do it if they want, and we hope that they do. There's more that can be done, but uh, that's how we thought we'd address it for now. Now, to wrap up, there is nothing more important <laughs> to a kid's education than being able to read. It's not just an academic piece, members. 
but it's also vital to really appreciate life and the beauty that's around us, to be able to read literature, not just math. But they can't read at third grade. We all agree. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on or where you walk. They need it for academics, but they need it to fully enjoy and appreciate life. It's a priority. If the foundation of that building isn't, isn't sound, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. This has been driven by parents from the beginning. It started off with dyslexia, morphed into literacy, because what helped with dyslexia helps with kids reading. Parents drove this. Then we got Education Minnesota involved, um, uh, MSBA, uh, Union, I already mentioned them, uh, the department, all were involved in this, non-mandated, parent-driven, and this is what we have come to. They are seeing success, the fruits of their labor over the years. Um, so there's some issues that have been out there, hiding in plain sight perhaps. This is simply an attempt to focus like a laser beam on a particular problem that matters more than anything else to kids, being able to read by third grade. After that, without that, you know, science and math becomes a problem. Everything is a problem. Discipline's a, discipline's a problem. Jail's a problem. Mental health's a problem. Reading, 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 100% all the time. Our goal is 90% proficiency by within about five or six years. And by the way, that's the world's best workforce goal too, 90%. So sorry for the long, discuss, long uh, prelim, but it is important. It's short, it's small, it's cheap. 30.7 million, but it is a lot of leverage, a lot of good can come from this, bipartisan in all these areas. So thank you for the time and your indulgence. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. I think before we do amendments, we're going to go to um, Ms. Hofer. Anything you'd like to add to the conversation on the... Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Members in front of you, you should have a spreadsheet. Um, it's one that I already referred to. Uh, it's just a small single page spreadsheet. Uh, at the top of it, it says general fund appropriations, change items only for the education finance, omnibus Senate file 4113. Uh, so this details the appropriations on a change item basis for the bill. Uh, beginning on line 10, you'll see the appropriations for letters, the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling program. That would be $30 million in fiscal year 2023. On line 11, there's an appropriation to the Department of Education, uh, the regional centers of excellence to support literacy support directors at each regional center. Uh, this is $700,000 per year beginning in fiscal year 2023. On line 12, uh, you'll see funding for the menstrual products in schools through the Operating Capital Revenue Fund. Uh, so as stated earlier in the hearing, that would be $1.7 million in the 2022-2023 biennium and $3.8 million in the 24-25 biennium. On line 14, you have the net total of appropriations for the bill. Uh, so in fiscal year 2023, this would increase appropriations from the general fund by $32,437,000. In fiscal year 2024, it would increase appropriations by $2,624,000. And in fiscal year 2025, it would increase appropriations by $2,591,000. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Hover. Any questions on that? I do think we will go, before we go to the commissioner, we'll go to Senator Kiffmeyer, who's had her hand up for a very long time. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I offer the A40 amendment. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer offers the A40 amendment. I think we need to post it and hand it out. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this uh, amendment, uh, the A40 amendment, 
uh, deletes a section, but most importantly what it does, uh, the effect of this, it's rather technical language here, modifies the appropriation for the literacy training program, clarifying a priority for teachers of students in grades K through five. Most critical years um, are K through five in reading. Uh, the next thing it does, it makes the letters appropriation available through fiscal year 27 uh, for teachers who have enrolled in it but have not yet completed letters. So it goes through the end then of fiscal year 2025. Uh, removes a uh, section of the bill that we just heard, Senator Kwasinski's bill. Since that is traveling separately, we're removing the sections pertaining to that individual bill since it's traveling separately. And that, Madam Chair, is the effect of the A40 amendment. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Chamberlain. Yeah, uh, thank you. We, um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Senator Swodinski's bill, we uh, heard it in K-12 and it got adopted into this as an amendment. So we do support, support the bill. Uh, we just want, I think it's preferable to have a literacy appropriations bill focused strictly on uh, literacy. It keeps uh, Senator Swodinski's bill alive, on the floor, ready for debate to move forward. So I, I like that idea, I appreciate that. Uh, secondly, there was some concern about the letters language and making sure that it could be used later on and then tightening it up a little bit. There are people who would like to use some money for grades higher, but right now the elementary ed's a priority and we want to make sure that that money can be used after that uh, for those final two years. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I'm just puzzled by taking out Senator Swazinski's thing. I know it's traveling alone. Is it traveling alone in the House as well? I don't know what it's Senator been, Chamberlain. I'm sorry, Senator, uh, Ms. Madam Chair. I don't know what it's happening in the House, Senator Marty. Senator Marty. Madam Chair, it strikes me that we have a lot of bills that have come out of this committee in two or more different places. So I'll move to strike line 1.8 on the, on the amendment. 1.8? I think that's the line deleting section, is it section 14? Yes, it would be. There's a lot of uh, sections 9 and 10 are all integrated. Oh, I'm sorry, page 1.3 then of the amendment was the one I'd like to strike. Senator, uh, I think you're trying to re remove Reinstate, this amendment. Keep okay. the Swazinski language in here just because I think we passed a lot of bills out here that are in two different places. Mr. Bodder, what, are, what would be the motion? Or Mr. Nelman. Madam Chair, I think the motion to retain that provisions, Ms. Hofer can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it would be to delete line 1.2 and delete 1.3 in addition to line 1.8 if Senator Marty's intent is to retain, retain the full entirety of Senator Swazinski's menstrual products bill that was heard earlier. Yeah, correct. Madam Chair, that's correct. So I guess it's lines 1.2 and 1.3. And 1.8. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I support Senator Marty's motion. Um, you know, we, this is in theory sort of an omnibus bill. I realize that Senator Chamberlain has made the decision for it to be focused on one area. Um, I think that is still subject to conversation as well. Um, and as Senator Marty says, we have merged all kinds of bills together in this committee uh, as they move forward in this process. It is on this spreadsheet. Um, for the, the that we've seen today, so I'm assuming it fits with what we call session priorities. I believe is the language we've used. I hope these um, dollars align, and I'm truly concerned that if this is if this travels by itself, that it will just be conveniently forgotten. And this is too big a, an issue, a, too big an opportunity to make a difference. And I think it should continue with the with the Senate File 4113. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't support um, uh, removing uh, those uh, lines two, three, and eight. Um, I think when we've had other bills traveling together, they've been similar topics and all of that. So here we have a real focus on literacy, and we've already voted 
on the Kwadzinski language. This committee has already demonstrated its support for this language and moved it on to general orders. But it do really doesn't belong in a uh, literacy bill as the focus is here. It's not the same as others that we have merged. So I would not accept um, this amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Kiffmer. And I, too, would like to uh, take out the uh, Senator Swadinsky's, Swadinsky's um, bill. And I can assure you, Senator Kant, that it is, um, it has been, as Senator Kamara said, it's been heard, it's been voted on out of this committee, and we will uh, keep it alive on the floor. And uh, I, I believe Senator Chamberlain wants to have a clean literacy bill um, onto the floor, and uh, that's the vote that we will take. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and before I forget, I'd like to ask for a roll call on this um, motion. Um, I, I, this is another case where because we don't have access to what would traditionally be considered targets, we don't know what the plan is, we don't know where the finances are, I'm concerned that this becomes a reason to say, sorry, we thought this seemed like a good idea, we were glad we voted it out of committee, but we're ultimately not going to support to pass it out of the Minnesota Senate. And so I um, appreciate your assurances and I, I trust your good intentions, um, but at the same time, we don't know what the plan is in terms of the budget. Uh, and and, uh, and we don't have assurances from uh, the leadership of your caucus the, um, that, that these commitments that are being offered here are uh, going to be honored. And so, um, again, I would like to encourage members to support Senator Marty's amendment. Senator Marty moves to delete lines two, three, and eight of the A40 amendment. A roll call has been requested. A roll call granted. Ms. Johnson, would you please take the roll? Chair Rosen. Chair votes no. Vice Chair Ingebrigtsen. No. Senator Marty. Aye. Senator Benson. No. Senator Champion. Aye. Senator Johnson. No. Senator Kent. Aye. Senator Kiffmeyer. No. Senator Lopez Franzen. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Lopez Franzen. There being three ayes and six noes, the motion does not prevail. To the A40 amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer renews her motion on the A40 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? Nay. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Chamberlain. And then I think we will we'll do your amendment, Senator uh, Chamberlain. Champion, I'm sorry. Yes, I did. I did. Uh, did she, uh, <laughs> okay. Ms. Madam Chair, Senator Champion, did she say Chamberlain? She said I Chamberlain, did. but she's looking at I'm looking, Champion. I'm looking right at you. Right. <laughs> Should have put money on that this time. What a my, my mind is in Key West. I That's understand. Right. <laughs> Senator Madam Champion, Chair. and then we'll go to the commissioner. Um, I move the A43 amendment. Senator Champion moves the A43 amendment. Senator Champion, do we have that? It's. We I think it. so. We don't have it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So you want me to wait, uh, Madam Chair? Just one second. Yeah. Senator Chamberlain, you get a lot more respect if you bring uh, donuts to the uh, committee. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you are. I'm going to stop yeah. asking. I'm, I'm hiding behind my computer. <laughs> the IOUs are getting long and large. Yep. <laughs> Senator Champion, we cannot seem to find it. So could you remove your motion and we'll go to the commissioner and take a look at it? Yes, I will withdraw my Thank motion. you. Uh, Senator Champion withdraws his A43 uh, motion. Commissioner Mueller, welcome.
Good morning. Can good morning, okay? Commissioner. Good Very morning. nice to see you. It's nice to see you, especially in person. And yes, and, I know. And having the opportunity to be able to meet with you and superintendent. Absolutely, and I, and I do want to say a, um, a public welcome and thank you for the attention that you've given my superintendents uh, through the years. And I'm sorry to not be working with you longer, but uh, we go back a long way, which is great. And. Uh, it's very good to have you in front of the Finance Committee. Thank you very much. I, I too, wish we could work together longer, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair and Senators, my name is Heather Mueller, and I'm the Commissioner of Education. Thank you for the opportunity to testify to the Senate Finance Committee on Senator Chamberlain's bill uh, to fund educator training in literacy and then limited support for our regional centers of excellence to help implement literacy practices at the local level. Um, Usually, uh, when I'm in front of the Education Committee, I have the opportunity to share that I believe that people sit in the Education Committee in the space because they want to do what is best for our students, our families, and our staff. And I know that we may come at it from a very different perspective, but if we always center our students, then I know that we're coming at it from a place where I can presume positive intentions. And so as I uh, was looking forward to the bill coming forward, and we've had the opportunity to connect with Senator Chamberlain on our bold literacy as well as a number of other education pieces, um, I had hoped that we would see those education pieces reflected in our omnibus bill, um, but as Senator Chamberlain said, it is primarily a literacy omnibus bill and not an education omnibus bill. Um, I will also want to say very publicly how much I appreciate Senator Chamberlain's commitment to literacy and his tireless efforts to be able to drive um, a laser focus in supporting our students, our families, and our educators in um, having a improving uh, on our literacy rates and ensuring that our teachers are educated and have the support that they need to be able to deliver high quality instruction in our classrooms. And with the myriad of fa uh, challenges that we're facing uh, for Minnesota students, families, and educators that came prior to the pandemic and throughout the pandemic, um, we also know that we need to be able to look at having a substantive investment in not only in literacy, but in other areas. The governor, Lieutenant Governor, I and many others have repeatedly said that in no uncertain terms that with this enormous surplus and remaining funding from the federal relief funds, we have an unprecedented and unmissable opportunity to change the trajectory for our students for the better. Our children and our educators need us to rise up to the challenge and meet this moment that's in front of us. And this bill fails the moment of meeting every aspect. It meets components of literacy. It fails to meet some of the other areas. Chair Rosen, committee members, I'm asking you to reconsider this path, seize the moment, and make the needed and varied investments that do right by our kids. Again, we agree that the more intensive focus on literacy is crucial to the academic success for our students. Um, but we have also heard that we have need we have received the feedback and seen results from letters training that educators that were able to be funded last year's bill, we have piloted that and we have seen a vast majority of that bill of what's in front of you today. We know the dedicated intervention and assistance work that our regional centers of excellence team do in our schools is the type of partnerships that our districts want, our districts need, and that they directly benefit from. The governor's bill also addresses literacy with our bold literacy plan, which Chair Chamberlain has praised. Um, it does go beyond beyond his bill because it bridges the knowing and doing gap by also funding systemic supports in various ways to ensure that teacher training is at its most effective when actually being implemented in the classroom. We know as adult learners that anytime you have the opportunity to learn something, you not only need that at that moment, but then there is ongoing opportunities for support to ensure high fidelity of what you've learned. And we want to make sure that that is included in this. However, with so many challenges that are facing our students due to the compounded underinvestment over the past two decades in education, the pandemic and a range of other issues, we simply can't focus on literacy alone. It's plain to see that state leaders must make a stronger and bolder investment in our public school system. A large investment in letters training alone may be difficult to implement and will not provide all the solutions that our students and families in schools need. We have heard from almost every partner across the state, from our students, from our families, from our educators, that we need to support mental health for our students and educators, and it must be a priority at the state in the wake of the pandemic and prior to the pandemic. The Senate's proposal does not very, does very little for this area. In fact, literacy really does solve a number of issues, but it is not going to solve all mental health support issues. We know that we want to be able to propose and pro be proactive in systemic mental health solutions, including funding to increase student support personnel, early mental health consultation and screening, and funding for mental health services. 
We know that students who receive appropriate mental health supports have improved academic achievement, are more likely to graduate, and are more likely to attend and successfully complete college or enter into the workforce. We know that students learn better, read better, when they have the opportunity to have not only complementary but ancillary supports that our schools are positioned to provide if the funding and the direction is given. I'm asking you to please rethink the inclusion of some of the packages in the governor's bill, including funding for things like a multi-tiered system of support, more career and technical education revenue, full service community schools, and directed supports for intermediate schools and keeping our children fed with universal meals. As I've mentioned, with this historic opportunity to make the investments our schools need to best support our students, this bill again does not ride to that part of the challenge. I implore you to adopt the governor's proposals to increase the general education formula, reduce the special education cross subsidy, increase English learner revenue, and invest in our American Indian students. Our schools have made clear that these are supports that they need for systemic structure and barriers. The research shows us that setting up our children for success starts with high quality early learning opportunities. This is where the building blocks of literacy starts. K, K through five is an integral component. We know that being able to read by third grade and the research that tells us that and what that means for a pipeline for, to, um, to prison and what we've also seen for a pipeline to ensure that we have our students on track. But it doesn't mean that literacy starts in kindergarten. Literacy starts for, for many children when they are at home with their families and they have, or have the opportunity to enroll in pre-kindergarten, have scholarships to go to pre-kindergarten, to have early childhood family education, and to really partner early. If everything that we are doing continues to be reactive, we are never going to be on the front end. And so a place to start is in early learning. So academically, the way that we're thinking about that is first for our having a, a targeted mixed delivery pre-kindergarten program that will serve 23,000 students, meeting parents where they are at a school-based program, um, a Head Start, a family-based provider, or a child care center. We also propose a significant $75 million increase to Pathway 1 early learning scholarships because this is also about parent choice. Academically, our solution is not solely the bold literacy plan. We also focus on creating more academic opportunities and supports for our students. We need to be able to amplify and build skills in content knowledge, social emotional learning, behavioral support, and core knowledge, which obviously includes literacy. We need to reimagine that opportunities that our high school students have and amplify the ones that they already should have, but may not be equitably accessible. We know that sometimes geographic equity is not the same. We have students who do not have access to CTE courses, who do not have access to AP courses, who do not have access to PSEO courses or IB, IB courses because of where they live. And sometimes it is also included because of the color of their skin. And we need to recognize that we need to provide opportunities both demographically and geographically to our students. We can also create welcoming environments for our students that keep them there by supporting who they are, including our American Indian education supports, non-exclusionary discipline practices and policies, inclusive of the, the prohibition of suspension of students in grades kindergarten through three, and supporting the social emotional needs of our students. We also know that we need to be able to diversify our educator workforce. Let's build on the great bipartisan solutions from last session that Senator Chamberlain talked about and fund the Grow Your Own and set goals for our teacher diversity in this state. The state would also greatly benefit from strategies to retain new teachers like like bonuses for aspiring teachers and robust teacher mentoring and induction systems. One of the things that we've had the opportunity to talk about with superintendents across the state is not only are we struggling to diversify the educator workforce, we are struggling to have an educator workforce. And we can continue to admire the problem or we can actually take steps to solve the problem. We have a unique opportunity to be proactive again, to recognize that we can also try to pilot and utilize innovative ways to be able to help to support the acquisition of new staff or new educators into our profession, not only starting in high school, but also bringing people who are ed educator support personnel, paraprofessionals, into our education system. The people are there. We just need to provide opportunities to help them choose this path. Madam Chair, I want to be clear. We fully support providing more supports to our students, our families, and our educators for improving literacy. Our bold literacy plan is out there, but I also want to be clear that focusing on just a small component of that will not meet what we have been hearing the needs are. The Senate's education bill simply comes up too short for the moment that we're in. I strongly encourage you to reconsider placing the necessary resources in our public education and taking this opportunity to fundamentally shift the trajectory of our Minnesota students for the better. 
thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any questions, comments for the Commissioner? I do want to say, oh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not sure, um, first I'd like to start with, if I could, just ask a couple questions. So Senator Chamberlain, um, just in general, tell me about, because uh, I know you've done the, the history and you know the history of, of uh, education in Minnesota. The literacy uh, in the, uh, let's say, 80s and 90s, was it quite high as compared to now? Senator Chamberlain. Results? Thank you, thank you Madam Chair and Senator Ingenbretson. I'd have to look to be sure, but it, it, it was better. <laughs> um, it certainly wasn't declining. So uh, something's missing. And I would say that part of that reason is simply there was kind of a, a switch in the way reading was, they thought reading should be taught into this whole language sort of uh, idea. And that simply didn't work. And the um, National Reading Council 2000, 2000 met and they affirmed the science of reading approach and not a whole language approach. So we've known how to teach reading for quite some time, but sometime in the 80s, in the 90s, uh, that thought switched a bit. Uh, and, Senator Ingebrigtsen. And, and to the commissioner, uh, you said that this area, uh, the, uh, the bill misses a lot of areas, and I think you may have covered them. I, I had this written down as a question. Uh, literacy, I think the, the senator, at least to me, uh, made the case on if you can't read, you can't you can't possibly even do any of the things that you're talking about having to fund, quite frankly, PSEO, whatever. You just can't do it. Um, I, I'm just flabbergasted, quite frankly, uh, that that uh, I'm, I'm wondering where, where has the education system gone? Where has it been when we have to give more money now to teach the teachers how to teach our kids how to read? Reading, writing, and arithmetic is what I used to... I remember when my parents and grandparents talked, and really, you know, that's a tradition that should never have gone away. It seems to have, though, and and I'm just I'm just baffled that we're spending this kind of money on teaching teachers how to teach kids how to read. It's just amazing to me. But uh, the the stats are showing that we're falling and not doing very well, and uh, we're going to be some we're going to be throwing some money at it now, and, and hopefully uh, uh, we got some way of monitoring that and making sure that that it happens um, moving forward, but I'm, I'm just flabbergasted, I guess. And I wouldn't be a teacher for anything. That'd be the last job I'd ever want. <laughs> I could not do it. But um, I just don't understand why, why we have to, why we're, we're not better than that. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Senator Kent. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I want to, Senator Ingebrigtsen started getting at the question I wanted to ask the commissioner. Um, you know, uh, having served on the Education Committee all these years, um, I know we have often said, uh, and I remember this as a parent advocate in, in my school district before I ever thought about running for office, um, children uh, learned up till third grade, learned to read, and after third grade, they read to learn. And so nobody is denying the importance of literacy and making sure that our, our kids can read effectively and fluently at third grade. Um, and Senator Chamberlain, I absolutely appreciate and applaud your commitment to uh, this issue for many years, um, and I've been on some of your bills over the years. I, you know, I, I absolutely believe your sincerity here. The question I have for the commissioner is, within this idea of putting all of our eggs, not very many eggs, um, in this one particular type of literacy training basket, uh, it seemed to me that in your um, remarks you commented that there's, this is good, but that even within the specific area of literacy that there's more we should be doing. In terms of the evidence-based nature of literacy and teaching kids how to read, can you give us a little bit more information and insight on what, what else you think would be important for literacy that's not included in the bill we're looking at today? Commissioner Mueller. 
chair chamber. Uh, sorry, I'm used to being saying chair chamber. Mm. <laughs> you can call me whatever. Yes, well, I, it's, a, it's a trend this morning. <laughs> Over there. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So Chair Rosen and uh, Senator <clears throat> Kent, I think a couple of things are important to note is that when we look at any type of opportunities for learning, we need to first think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What we recognize is that students need to know that they have a place to live, that they have, um, that they are secure in their food, and that they are safe in their homes. Um, and or with, with their, their caregivers. I think the second thing that we know is that when we talk about literacy, uh, reading and literacy, teaching literacy is rocket science. Um, not everybody can do it, to your point, Senator. There are a lot of people who choose not to be educators um, because it is not easy and it is very difficult. But the ability to be able to teach reading means that there are five components and you need to be on time and in order. And when those five things do not happen on time and in order, we know that there are gaps. And when you move beyond third grade and have the opportunity to read and, and learn in that content space, that those gaps in, in literacy mean that you're also meeting gaps in content. And so our ability to be able to provide that support early on is incredibly important. And as uh, Senator Chamberlain said in the 80s and 90s, it was called the reading wars in education. We knew that that's what they were because there was a battle about the very best way to be able to provide instruction. And that actually was a, a catalyst of pause, quite frankly, um, and, and making decisions about how are we going to best to provide literacy. Um, and our institutions of higher education had to make decisions about that. We also know that as um, schools come together that they need to be able to look at how are they doing that in their classrooms and higher education has had to figure out how to provide that and also recognize that school districts are going to teach them what they need to know and be able to do as well. And so when we're thinking about the things that you need to have, you need to have, you know, you should be looking at universal meals. We should be looking at providing social emotional learning to ensure that just like we are the five components of literacy, there are five bases of social emotional learning and competency. And we need to recognize that those are pieces we need to consider as well. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner. I'm looking at the um, chart that Senate Council provided, fourth grade average reading scale score compares Minnesota to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. What's Mississippi doing that they're able to accomplish this? What parts of the governor's budget have been incorporated into the Mississippi um, literacy improvement? Commissioner Mueller. Thank you, Chair Rosen and Senator Benson. Um, I think that being able to compare Minnesota to um, to Mississippi is just not an accurate um, reflection. They are not the same. When we look at, at our MCA scores, these, the tests that are developed by the state of Minnesota are not the same as the tests that are created by Mississippi. The federal guidelines are the federal guidelines, but not all tests are created the same. So it is not an apples to apples comparison. Also, when you look at the data that was created by Mississippi, um, they also retain or hold students back. And so um, in looking at that, they are not necessarily fourth grade students always. They are fourth grade students on paper. So, um, Senator Benson. Madam Chair, so what you're saying is the National Assessment of Educational Progress is not uniform? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Commissioner you, Mueller. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you talked about their, their state test. I'm, so, um, no, Madam Chair, I Senator clearly Benson. referenced yeah. this chart. Yeah, I don't have that chart. Right. What is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, mm -hmm. and why are they improving and we're getting worse? Have you looked at that? Commissioner Ringo? Yes. Sen uh, Commissioner, um, yes. Thank you. We're getting your chart. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Senator Rosen, um, Senator Benson, yes, we have looked at that. And we also know that, and the way that we're able to look at that particular st stream of data is we also recognize what that means. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> what that means in, um, in fourth grade across not only um, Minnesota, but also across Mississippi, we do recognize that there are places that Mississippi is improving, and so is Minnesota. And so we are looking at how it is we provide that on time and in order support, how it is we align with what we're doing with our institutions of higher education, how it is we are partnering to ensure that not only only do we have early um, education um, services available to our students, but also that we are in providing on time and in order instruction. So, Senator Madam Chair, Commissioner, so Mississippi is already doing all of those things and that's why they're gaining ground or not? Commissioner Mueller. Uh, Chair Rosen, Senator Benson, um, Mississippi is doing some of those things. Okay. And, Madam and Senator Chair, Benson. Uh, Commissioner, which of those things? Commissioner Mueller. Yeah. 
Chair Rosen and Senator Benson, there are a couple of different pieces. One, they are implementing some components of um, letters, which is very similar to what um, we are implementing at this point. They are also um, in, ensuring that they have access to um, early childhood education, um, which is another important component. And Senator Madam Benson. Chair, do they have more access to early childhood education than we do in Minnesota? Commis uh, Commissioner Mueller. Chair Rosen, Senator Benson, that's something that I'll have to check back on. Um, thank you, Senator Madam Benson. Chair. Commissioner, do they fund their students more than we do? Commissioner Mueller. Um, Senator Benson, I think that the way that we talk about funding our students is, is a little bit different, and so I want to have to go back and look at that. Okay, thank you, Senator Madam Benson. Chair. I guess the point is Senator Chamberlain is trying to solve a fundamental problem and that a lot of our kids don't read at grade level. And I read something, seven out of 10 felons don't read above the fourth grade level. Seven out of 10 people in prison don't read above grade level. Senator Chamberlain has called this out and I believe there is an urgency and trying to learn from states who have done things differently than Minnesota is a really good way to catch up without trying a bunch of things. I, we, I, I was there for the reading wars. I was starting a kid in school during the reading wars. I chose a school that was focused on phonics because it had been proven for so long. And now we're back and we're having to reteach teachers. Can we just focus on the thing that fundamentally changes the life of a child and learn from a place. Like Mississippi did something because things started getting better. So if you can tell me what they did, happy to listen. But for now, I'm gonna support Senator Chamberlain on this walk for the benefit of kids, not ignoring all the other things, but until somebody can prove all of the other things in the governor's budget are as effective as what he has. Let's do the thing that's the biggest bang for the buck that most fundamentally changes the life of that child. They can't learn history if they can't read. They can't learn science if they can't read. How, how are they going to fill out a job application if they can't read? So I think everybody at this table should be thrilled that Roger Chamberlain has taken this very intentional, scientifically based, purposeful, effective approach and quit arguing about a bunch of other things and say for once we are going to agree that the priority of children learning to read is going to be the thing that we champion in this legislative session. Thank you, Senator Benson. Any further questions or comments? Senator Kickmeyer, did you have something? Are you good? You took your hand down? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was kind of going along the same line that Senator Benson was, so I was glad to support what her approach was. And as she did, Madam Chair, my, I think my biggest thing was, if there's anything that I think of uh, the job of the school is to teach kids to read. It's so fundamental. All the other classes, everything else, depended upon the ability to read. And if you can't do that in a school, then it begs the question, what is the point of having the school if the most basic thing is teaching them to read and we're not succeeding at teaching them to read? And I would agree with Senator Benson, we're not ignoring any of the other important things. I'm the oldest of 14 kids. <laughs> we learned to read and it was crucial for us. I'm here today because of those teachers who focused on reading. My husband's uncle, uh, teacher of the year twice, taught biology. His kids started school at first grade, and he said, the only thing I really want them to focus on is reading. He said, the rest, kids will move along quite nicely. And that's a teacher of the year twice saying so. He had 10 children, by the way. We come from a lot of big families. My husband's small at just 10 kids, so he's, uh, that seems to be their limit and cap. They went with 10. Uh, but I think that the big thing is understanding that. So appreciation for all my brothers and sisters and everybody else was that fundamental responsibility of a school, and especially when it's a public school. The justification for public dollars 
uh, from the inception of all this was focused on those basics, reading, the ability to write, and the ability to do math. And we're talking about really basic stuff. If you can't get the basics, it begs the question of then, why do you exist? And we consider all the other things without question, support of families make a difference. But I think that um, that makes it even more important if you have those underlying problem family situations, even more important for those children are the ability to uh, fundamentally, first of all, read, then to be able to write, and then to do that math. And I think it is a question that a lot of people are asking now, what is the point if you can't even have a school teach reading? And Senator Chamberlain here has focused in on that most critical part, uh, both in the language and the policy, and I especially appreciate the um, reading proficiency goals for school districts to establish a plan that's really kind of fundamental and basic. But Commissioner, I would expect that you would support something like the letters program that is a proven success record. So is there any reason why you could not support this proficiency goal for our school districts and the language of Senator Chamberlain's bill? Is it that you don't support this, Commissioner? Commissioner Mueller. Uh, Chair Rosen and um, Senator Kimpmeyer, no. Actually, I have stated several times that I completely agree with being able to implement the, the literacy components and don't disagree. What I'm saying is, is that there are pieces that go beyond um, looking at literacy to be able to help to support students, families, and educators. <laughs> Some of the pieces that are missing that are identified in uh, Senator Chamberlain's uh, proposal really are components for being able to help to ensure that there is not a knowing doing gap and ensuring that we're able to provide ongoing support. We also have pieces that are moving forward with policy. We quite frankly um, have agreed on the literacy components. There are pieces that we would like to see added, but I, I have said through the entire time that I've been up here that I agree on the components of literacy. Madam Chair. Senator Kipmer. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate hearing that, that you do have that support because it is foundational. And if you don't have the foundation, all the rest of the building collapses around you. And so uh, fundamentally, the, the family structure is really uh, very important, but all the more important than when they get to school, that the foundation of their education, which is really fundamentally reading, it's even more important for kids who come from a low-income home, more critically important to them. And everybody that you will find around almost even the world, that sort of situation exists. What got them out of poverty started with reading. And from that, you go forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator Kiffman. Commissioner, thank you very much for being here. And I do, I, I probably did not um, express how much I appreciated uh, you being on Zoom with all my 15 superintendents. Thank and you. you were very good about uh, attending those meetings and uh, very worthwhile for all of us. So um, we might have had um, opinion, a difference of opinion on many things, but um, you were there and I appreciate you uh, looking into the questions and problems. I did want to mention too um, that we have a significant $2.4 million ongoing per year for uh, mental health in the mental health bill that's traveling by itself for the school linked mental health program. Sure, so you. that is um, moving and it's, it's a good bill. But anyway, we take that very serious and I know we've talked about mm -hmm. that too. So with that, thank you very much for being here. Thank Members, you. I have to step away for a few minutes. So Vice Chair uh, Ingerbritson will take the gavel. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer the A42 amendment. Senator Kent offers the A42. Is it in our packets? No, okay, we'll have, it is. we're going to have to wait. Have to wait for posting, too, I guess.
Senator Kent, um, I'm wondering if you would mind uh, withdrawing the amendment and we'd go to Senator Champion, who's been kind of in, in waiting here, uh, and everybody would have an opportunity to, to digest the amendment. No, no, that's okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's okay if Senator Kent goes okay. first. Okay. It's okay. Thank, Thank you for your Thank consideration. You. Thank you. Senator Kent, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I very much appreciated um, the commissioner's discussion about the challenges that our kids are facing. Um, you know, one of the things that I've talked about in this committee in a number of areas, whether it was housing, whether it was uh, long-term care and disability services, um, care providers, um, child care, and now uh, education, and specifically in the areas surrounding our kids' mental health and well overall well-being, is that uh, Minnesota already in these areas was sort of band-aiding together solutions. And then the pandemic came and really just busted it all wide open for a variety of different reasons. And in the case of, um, and, and in the A42 amendment, as you'll see, it says student support personnel aid. In the case of what is known in our statute as student support personnel services, those are student school counselors, psychologists, social workers, nurses, and chemical dependency um, counselors. Those are, that is a group of professionals that is specified in Minnesota law. And when you put that together as a team, and they do work together for our kids in our schools as a team, Minnesota has ranked literally at the bottom in the nation in providing these important services to support our kids as they're named in uh, Minnesota statute. I have worked on this issue over the years. We've made a little bit of progress, but there has not been widespread support to take care of it, which is why, as our entire society has faced a range of pressures brought on by the pandemic, um, and if you listen to our parents, as I have been, and if you listen to our teachers, if you listen to the counselors and other student support personnel that we have in our schools, our kids are struggling. The behavioral issues, the, um, the struggles that they are facing are unprecedented. And as the commissioner said, we need to meet this moment for their behalf. How do they focus on learning to read if they are having some sort of crisis? And when you're a little kid, you, don't, you can't articulate that. Um, it, it manifests itself through behavior. Another thing that I have seen in my work with parents is that sometimes um, kids can hold it together okay at home, but these things show up at school. And it is, if, if you have teachers there who are able to identify it and if they can bring in trained professionals to help support, they can work with the families to get the kids the support that they need. So what this A42 amendment does to address this really critical crisis that our, our schools and our kids and our families are facing right now so that they can focus in school. And let's also point out that if, if they say it's a, a, a fifth grade classroom and there's a kid who's having a, some sort of behavioral crisis, no one's learning to read that day in that classroom. If there's not somebody who can be there to support that kid in that moment, because the teacher is going to have to deal with the behavioral issues. And these are just a few examples that I hear about over and over again. What the A42 amendment does is it uh, provides aid for student support personnel in bringing in new positions of the five that I just mentioned. Um, it provides comprehensive school mental health services lead position within the Department of Education. That has been a position that has been lacking. It's something that I've worked on over the years. And to be able to have somebody as a point person within our um, Department of Education to work with districts, to coordinate with the um, regional centers of excellence and other agencies um, would serve to benefit our schools across the state and the students that they serve. Um, and then an appropriation for children's school-linked mental health grants, um, which we know also makes a big difference. And there's one other uh, per, uh, component in here, a student support personnel pipeline. Um, we've talked about the workforce issues. It is interesting, um, we need to keep building in that area and adding to it, but, um, and we'll talk more 
I'm pretty sure as we speak further about this bill in general, but if you listen and look at the surveys that have already been conducted and listen to school districts around the state, we're going to see layoffs. Because I know we provided a lot of funds for our schools last year in the budget that we just passed a year ago, not quite a year ago. But we did it at a 2.45 inflationary factor, and we know that inflation is actually quite a bit higher than that. And our school districts across the state, big and small districts, are struggling, and we will see layoffs coming. And rightly, our districts want to protect class size because it's very important. So when you're protecting class size, you're keeping the classroom teachers and then first and foremost, and then it's the other professionals in our schools that end up being laid off. And so that's why there's this long tradition of counselors and social workers, et cetera, being sort of the first to get laid off. Um, but that means we actually have quite a few of them available to come into our schools with the kind of aid that we're providing here. So members, we need to meet this moment. We need to do it for our kids. and. Uh, uh, and then we can continue implementing letters and other literacy <coughs> efforts and uh, have a win-win situation and help our kids really get back on their feet after a rough few years and, uh, and, and back onto a successful path. Thank you. Uh, and I'll, before Senator Chamberlain, I'll go to Mr. Nauman for the actual total cost uh, Appropriation increase on the uh, on the bill before. So, Mr. Chair and members, over four years, it's a 586.2 million dollar increase in appropriations to the bill. Um, that parses out as 155 in fiscal 23, 107.9 in 24, 107.6 in 25. Mr. Chair, could you be a little louder, please? My apologies. I said, and also I said a four-year number. I should have said a three-year number. It is. And I overnumbered. So it's 155 million in fiscal 23, 107.9 in fiscal 24, and 107.6 in fiscal 25. So the tail is about 215 million dollars. I my initial assessment was wrong. Thank you, uh, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, thank you, Senator Kent. Last year's bill had almost no mandates in it. This bill has no mandates in it. We re actually re uh, relieved the schools of a mandate in our, our small proposal, our focused and targeted proposal. Um, we're addressing some of the needs to a social media digital, uh, digital well-being proposal from last year. Um, regional centers proposal in this bill this year also helps support schools. Um, unfortunately, I believe our schools have lost about 23,000 students, give or take, in the last year or so. That's having an impact on budgets as well. Um, and important, most importantly, this is a literacy appropriations omnibus bill, literacy appropriations. Um, we spread I know people think all we got to do is put money out there and, and we'll be able to solve a problem, but um, um, we don't have, there's not enough personnel out there to do these jobs. You can't find enough people to be plumbers or anything. Uh, so you could throw all this money out there, but that doesn't mean we're going to be able to find the people who are capable and licensed and willing to do it. We're just running out of bodies. So that was another reason for this targeted focused approach. There's this old symptom disease analysis comparison, analysis and comparison that uh, we're trying to too often we're trying to treat symptoms of the larger pro of us of another problem and not getting anywhere. What we're trying to do with this bill, being so focused and targeted, is to get at the heart of that disease and and treat that and not just symptoms. So. A lot of things are already in play to address a lot of the challenges in schools, mental health, social media, Rose, uh, Senator Rosen's school linked mental health uh, programs. We have a, still have a safe school aid bill out there. So there, we already have a lot of things in place. The desire is not to increase the burdens. The desire is not to just treat symptoms, but the desire is to treat and focus 
the core disease and challenge of what we face in that region. So I would oppose this amendment. Senator Marty. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Chamberlain, when you say that there's a shortage of providers to do this, I think there is generally a shortage of mental health providers in the state, but I was um, in a recent meeting with um, some school counselors. I talked, heard from one woman who I think she came from West Metro, and she was looking for a job in, in school social work or social mental health stuff, and she got a position up on the Iron Range. She moved up there because she wanted to be working in this field. Then they had layoffs, so she moved down to, at Mac, to the metro area, East metro area. Then she moved again. She had like three or four moves trying to get a job, but the districts didn't have the funding for the positions. And there were several other people on the call who talked about the same thing, how they would love to have a full-time position working with students in mental health. The shortage of people, I, there are a lot of shortages in mental health. I think we all know that. But for these school-based professionals, there are, I've heard from a number of them who are looking for positions. So I, I really challenge your statement on that. I think there are plenty of people who do. And as Senator Kent's amendment has, that I think it's $9 million in there for um, this pipeline for helping rec recruit new people, especially in underrepresented areas. I think that's very important. But the other thing, just a general comment, because the, listening to the discussion about literacy, and I'm not on the education committee, I don't know this letters business, whoever that company is, um, and I'm sure it's a good company because everybody's saying wonderful things about it. But um, some of the comments earlier, if students don't learn to read, they can't, everything else follows from reading, so literacy is important. I don't disagree. But everything else follows from mental health, too, if the student isn't able to participate and grow from the reading skills, they need that as well. In other words, it's all closely linked together. When the commissioner was saying what we have to do is better job with the early childhood, that all relates to literacy too. I'd argue addressing students' mental health needs is one of the best things we can do to promote literacy. There's nothing in the bill for this. And frankly, when I saw a list, AMSD put out a list of Roseville schools in my areas facing a two and a half million dollar shortfall right now. St. Paul, 42.8. White Bear, 5.8 million dollar shortfall they're projecting. So they're going to be laying off the people you're trying to train for literacy. I, I think that Senator Kent's amendment is an important one because just as literacy is so critical, and I don't think, I haven't heard anyone, I mean, somebody was going after suggesting the commissioner couldn't believe the commissioner didn't support the literacy efforts. She said she clearly does. I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that. And when we talk about mental health, I thought everybody was agreeing that if we don't address the mental health needs, we can't do the other things in education. So Senator Kent's amendment seems to be one of the best things we can do if we want to improve literacy by helping students be able to be stable and able to be able to learn and able to benefit from the literacy. Mr. Chair. Senator Chamberlain. Just quickly, um, yeah, this bill wasn't heard in committee either. It's a large bill, very complicated bill, very far reaching bill. And from my looking at it here, there's nothing here that says hire more teachers. This is just an additional uh, support for an addition to that. And um, I would just say, look, there are a lot of kids out there who are in a bad way because they can't read. They can't read, so they are not coming to school. They are uh, disruptive, and nothing else matters because they're frustrated. They're quiet in school, in the classrooms. They won't do anything. That is a big reason you have a lot of the problems. So again, uh, the intent of this is not necessarily bad, but I think we're treating the symptoms and not getting at the real heart of the problem here, and that's, that's reading. So this is big, it's complicated, it's expensive. We haven't heard in committee. There may be good aspects to this, but uh, again, we're focusing on literacy because we believe that is the center, central core problem and if that's not, if we deal with that, we're going to deal, we're going to reduce uh, special ed costs. We're going to reduce the behavioral problems and a lot of other things. So thank you.
Senator Kent, and then I think we should move the amendment. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And Senator Chamberlain, you know, I, I think we just fundamentally disagree where the root problem is. I mean, I remember when I was a, a president of the PTSO in my son's school and I was having a conversation with the principal out, it was while kids were in class, it was a very quiet time in the building and we were in one of the areas was the elementary building near the lockers. And as we were talking, I became conscious of a sound and over time it became clear this was about a five-year-old kid who was having a meltdown. And it continued to be a problem. And the, the staff in that school worked really hard with that family to try to support that child, a five-year-old. I don't know how we can say that literacy is the root problem of that child's situation and others. Um, I think if the kids are not in a position to be able to learn to be at peace mentally, emotionally, in terms of their ho housing and family stability, we know um, food insecurity is a huge problem for our kids. We're missing supporting them. And, and it's our social workers who help connect families with the services they often need to, to, to solve some of those problems. And we don't have school social workers anymore. And I think it's interesting that we've looked at Mississippi as a comparison. Um, my father's family's from Mississippi. I grew up just a few miles from Mississippi. Um, Mississippi ranks at the bottom of almost every single health and education metric that you can find. And Minnesota typically, we are pleased to say, does not. But Minnesota does rank at the absolute bottom and has for decades in providing these uh, professionals to support our schools and our kids. And so I think it's important that we talk about where the real root problems are. I was astonished when I came into the Minnesota Senate and that was something that I learned pretty early on. And I was horrified by that knowledge. <laughs> And we still haven't really done anything meaningful to address it. And we have an opportunity right now. It is a historic problem. We have an historic opportunity. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I renew my motion for the A42 amendment. A roll call has been, <coughs> excuse me, a roll call has been requested for the A42 amendment. Please call the roll. Chair Rosen. <coughs> Vice Chair Ingebrigtsen? No. Senator Marty? Yes. Senator Benson? No. Senator Champion? Yes. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Kent? Yes. Senator Kiffmeyer? No. Senator Lopez Franzen? Yes. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Rosen? Vote of five no and four yes. The amendment does not pass. Senator Champion. Mr. Chair, before we go I'm, to I'm another, sorry. it's me, Senator. <laughs> Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator, Senator Kiffmeyer. Sorry. Yeah, sir. Before we move off of this topic, um, Mr. Chair, I just wonder if Mr. Nauman could confirm that. Uh, the ESSR, I think $1.3 billion of the federal money came. One of the eligible uses is mental health, and it's available till, I think, 2024. Can you confirm if that is my understanding correct? Mr. Nauman. Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, I'm not sure I know that topic off the top of my head, but we will make sure that we get an answer and get back to you. Thank you. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the A43 amendment. And the amendment has been posted. Um, is it going to be passed out? Champion, I believe everybody's got a copy um, 
of the amendment uh, to the A43. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like by start, starting to say that I've been listening to a lot of testimony today from the commissioner, from uh, Senator Chamberlain, um, and just other various members from around the table. Um, and education is always one of those really interesting um, discussions that we have because I believe that education is the threshold to improving our quality of life. But I also think it's important for us not to uh, continue to politicize education as if it's only one thing that we should do and we ignore everything else. To me, that makes no sense. Everything that we must do must be balanced and comprehensive. When individuals around this table begin to talk about um, all you need to do is just go to school, just concentrate on it, and just read, that's it. And ignore whether the person is hungry, or if they're coming from a shelter to a school building. We know that when there's stable housing, there's better educational outcomes. How about the fact that if a kid can't see the handwriting on the board, how about it if they can't read because they need glasses, and I want you to know that I'm one who believes in fashionable eyewear. That's very obvious. It, it's so, it's so, so we don't have the ability to read because we don't have glasses and a accurate prescription. That too undermines a child's ability to read. So I believe that we have to have a comprehensive approach to this whole issue of education. And I would just implore us to do that. I'm not on any of the education, educational committees but I believe in education as I was the first person in my family to go to college, so I understand the importance of it. Now, what is before you, the A43 amendment, I think Senator Chamberlain is something that you will embrace, I hope, because you've been talking profusely about literacy. And this lead abatement amendment is about literacy. Now, why do I say that? It's because we know that the effects of lead on children is deadly and challenging. What are some of the things that it does? One, it, it, uh, the effects of lead to children damage to one's brain and nervous system. If you have these other things happening, you're not able to focus and concentrate and process information. We know from the studies that there's slowed growth and development. Development is important. And Senator Chamberlain, you were just talking about if people are misbehaving and, and, and doing all these other things, that could also be an, an, an effect or a byproduct of lead because it does affect your learning and creates behavior problems. And as I mentioned earlier, hearing and speech is also a part of this, even when I think about eyewear, I mentioned earlier. So this amendment uh, seems to um, model, if you will, Senate File 3956, which talks about um, uh, 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 lead in school drinking water. We believe that water is important. I know my good friend that is sitting next to me often talks about water. Uh, but we also know that testing is important in order to make sure that if there's the presence of lead, that there's something that is done in, in order to uh, mitigate that issue. And we are asking school districts to test for the presence of lead after completing certain activities that's required under the section. And the rest, I believe that you fully understand. And so uh, I'm asking for support for this, this effort to increase literacy by abating Led, and I would ask that you would join me in that. And I would also ask for a roll call, Mr. Chair. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Members, any questions? Mr. Dahlman. Mr. Chair, I think the question here was um, the price of the bill, and in fiscal 23, it's 1.851, yes. or the amendment rather. That's correct. The tail is 830, and. Uh, the uh, three-year price of 2.681. Mr. Chair, I think I heard Mr. Norman, and I just want to be clear on the number that I heard him say. I believe that there's a fiscal note. Did, did you say for 2.2 million, or what number did you give again? I'm sorry, Mr. Norman. My hearing is impaired. 
<laughs> this morning. Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, it's possibly possible my mumbling was acute as well, so my apologies. Um, 1.851 in fiscal year 23, the tail is 830, and so that gives you a three-year number of 2.681 on the price of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Nama. Senator Chamberlain, any more comments with regards to that? Chamberlain's over uh, here. You are looking at me, and you call I'm me sorry. Senator Chamberlain. We are uh, brothers. I keep telling people this that. Is gonna be a, this is, this is going to is gonna be an issue for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the only other thing that I'll say that this is an important investment for our children, and we understand the impacts of lead, and I don't want to regurgitate that again, but I'm asking for this to be a friendly amendment uh, 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 this morning. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Chamberlain. Well, um, two quick things. Um, I do agree with them. That's why it was my bill, and it's an HHS. We heard in K-12, it's an HHS, so I agree with you, Senator Champion, just not for this bill. This is more, it's not really a K-12 bill this, um, in itself, but I do agree with you. We heard it in K-12, passed it on to HHS, and that's where it's sitting. Following committee process, they have to hear it to determine if we're not sure about where the cost should be, uh, but there is a property tax increase in this, too. So. I do agree with you, but we have to work out some of the details, and it's over in HHS. It's not for this bill, so I would oppose it going into this particular arm bill. Thank you. Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Chamberlain, I'm glad you say you support it, though you got little details to work out, um, like the costs and everything else. It seems to me that we were just talking about the urgency of getting these steps forward to address literacy. and. And with the brain damages caused by lead, this strikes me as something that pretty urgent, because this is just getting at the beginnings of it, remediating it, testing. It seems to me that if you're caring about the urgency of addressing our literacy problems, we ought to be concerned about the ability of the children to learn to read, which this very directly relates to. So I wish you'd treat this with the same urgency that your portion of the literacy um, is trying to deal with because everybody's agreeing with you on that portion, but this part matters just as much. Mr. Chair. Chamberlain, Mr. Chamberlain. Sen Senator Chamberlain. Yeah, just quickly. <clears throat> um, they're already doing this. I mean, there's a whole section of statute members. They're already doing this, Senator Marty. Uh, you know, you got it here, right? They're already doing it. All this does is lowers it to five parts per billion and then adds some extra money for any remediation if necessary. So, I, have, I did talk to some people out there about it, and they said, you know, five parts per billion, okay, no lead is good, but five parts per billion could come from uh, anything. So there's details to work out. They're already working on this stuff in the schools. This isn't new. It just changes the level and puts some more money into it. So yes, it's important. I, uh, you shouldn't imply that it's not. So it is important. They're already working on it. This just changes the level. It's an HHS. We all agree here. We support the support our committee process, right? We all agree to that. That's where it's at. I was happy to author it and glad to pursue it over there, and I have been. Thank you, but not in this bill. To the amendment, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, I just, you know, talking with my superintendents and school districts, this issue hasn't come up before. So I was just curious on, uh, I think, Senator uh, Chamberlain, Chamberlain, um, he, uh, he answered the fact that they're actually doing the testing currently, but I hadn't heard about this. Who brought this forward? Have you been hearing about this from school districts, uh, Senator Champion? Senator Champion. Uh, <laughs> you keep messing up my name, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Johnson, yes, we've been hearing a lot about this. You know, we've been hearing a lot about uh, the damage caused by lead and that even the current levels need to go down, as Senator Chamberlain did state, that it's better to have no lead. But we need to keep making these incremental steps and, and important steps in order to make sure all of our children have the opportunity to drink water and not run the risk of drinking water with lead in it that cause all these other problems. So yes, it is something that uh, uh, we are hearing a whole lot about, and this is a step in the right direction. And if it wasn't, Senator Chamberlain would not have brought this bill forward. So it is really clear that he knows that it is of importance. He's talked about the importance of it. Just to say they're doing it 
is not enough because we know that we can always make those necessary steps in order to get better. We should just never just rest on our loins. We should always strive to be better. And I think this amendment makes us better. And I hope that Senator Chamberlain will accept it as it was heard. And even if it's parked somewhere else, we know that bills go to a number of different stops, especially if it touches on a number of different areas. School and children and education is one of the areas because it undermines a child's ability to learn, <coughs> read proficiently, and grow. Senator Pratt. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Champion, for for raising this issue. I worked on this with uh, uh, former Commissioner Casillas back in 2017 when we put in uh, some of the monies that uh, uh, that are referenced on pages uh, two and three. But it was very important because, you know, five parts per billion is what we're seeing in highly filtered drinking water, uh, bottled water, I mean. And the concern was that we can often get, that, that we wanted that guidance to be coming from the Department of Health, not, not necessarily sitting that, that high level in statute. And, um, and so we worked that out, and, and that was actually the commissioner, commissioner's concern at the time, was uh, making sure that uh, we allowed the Department of Health to, uh, to continue to monitor and, and say what those guidelines should be. In addition, um, we did allow for remediation. So oftentimes what will happen is that water will get this lead while it's sitting, and if you run the tap for two, three, five minutes, um, they can get the lead levels down, lead levels down to an appropriate level. So um, I would agree with Senator Ch uh, Chamberlain that um, this is probably a, a, a better uh, bill for the, for the Health and Human Services um, overall bill and and uh, but I do think we I do agree Senator Champion we have to continue to to drive those lead levels down and use remediation efforts less costly remediation efforts um, in our schools as often as possible Senator Champion thank you Mr. Chair so thank you for those words uh, 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 Senator, I appreciate all the work that you've done and that you'll continue to do on this. And, and, and if we are in agreement, I would hope that it could go on this bill, but if it cannot go on this bill, I hope that you'll join me in supporting uh, me if I bring this amendment forward when we talk about the Health and Human Service Bill today. So if we all say that that's the right place for it and we all agree that this is a great place for it to uh, ha happen, I would love for us to continue to have that discussion because there's no question that we do not want our children drinking water filled with lead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, member, Senator Champion renews his A43 amendment and he asked for a roll call. Please call the roll. Chair Rosen? Vice Chair Ingebrigtsen? No. Senator Marty? Yes. Senator Benson? No. Senator Champion? Yes. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Kent? Yes. Senator Kiffmeyer? No. Senator Lopez Franzen? Yes. Senator Pratt? No. Chair Rosen? On a vote of five, no. Four, yes. The amendment is not agreed to. Members, any further discussion or amendments? Senator Morty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have the A39 amendment. Senator, I guess we're going to have to wait on that. Senator Marty I'm offers sorry. the A, A, I'm sorry. A39 the amendment. A39. We'll get it passed out before we start uh, with that, Senator. Okay.
Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a small amendment, but an important request. And this is one that would, um, this is a year where we have money in the budget. And we have the ability to address some of our state's commitments. Our state basically is mandated on the schools special education, and it's mandated um, English language learning. And the federal government mandates as well, but I believe our mandates are stronger. And even if the federal government would remove it, ours remain. And when we put these requirements on the schools, we expect them to provide them. And we have, our education funding formula is supposed to take care of that. And we have um, huge deficits in terms of our funding for this. So the schools have had to cross subsidize it with other dollars. And if you look at this, I, I think um, Senator Nelson sent out a thing a few weeks ago saying how it looked like we had actually been increasing our spending for education vis-a-vis um, -vis inflation and so on, but didn't factor in some of the huge problems the districts are facing with cost subsidies. I know that in um, Roseville District, um, which I represent part of it, $11 million in cost subsidy. Uh, Senator Chamberlain, I believe it's over 10 million in White Bear, um, a whole range of these other the districts that every member of this committee serves. Um, every one of them is having huge subsidies for special education and for English language learning. And to me, before we talk about what else we should be doing with um, the money in the budget, the quote surplus money, is we should be keeping our own commitments as a state and we've committed to address these needs. And yes, people can say the federal government is committed to do like special education as well, but they haven't been keeping their share. And that doesn't excuse us from not doing, not doing the work. So this would pay off the cost subsidy for both special education and for English language learning. And I, I, I would be shocked if there is some member of this committee who hasn't heard from some of the districts they represent about the huge burden this is taking on them. And uh, again, when you look at all the districts that are facing layoffs, there's a reason they're facing layoffs, and it's because we're not funding our state mandates here. And so I urge your support and ask for a roll call. Roll call granted. Uh, Senator, or excuse me, Mr. Nolan. Would so, you, uh, Mr. Chair, the Senator, cost of the bill again, please. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, the price tag on this bill is uh, $913 million in fiscal 23 in aid. Um, the tail on this uh, amendment would be 2.139, a little over a billion dollars, almost 1.1 in each year. So, a three year total of $3.052 billion. Senator Chamberlain, to the amendment. Um, I just mean, no, we didn't discuss this in K-12 committee this year. Uh, it won't solve a problem. <laughs> They're suggesting here is, again, throwing money at something, hoping that by treating symptoms, they're going to solve the underlying disease, under, uh, get to the underlying problem. And this won't do it. It's very expensive. We didn't discuss this in the committee. It, this is a literacy omnibus appropriations bill, and that's um, what we hope to keep it at, uh, literacy omnibus appropriations bill. This is just more uh, this is just more game playing. This is not <laughs> going to fix the problem. This won't fix a single problem, but they can you can feel good talking about it and pretending to throw money at it. This won't fix the problem. So, no. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I would encourage every member to contact your superintendent and your finance director and your school board members and ask them if they think that the unfunded mandates, and I appreciate, Senator Chamberlain, you've talked about mandates and that we shouldn't have them. Well, these are real. They're real for very good reasons. Um, they are currently unfunded and uh, it affects our, our, our school district's budget. So let's ask those, those folks who run our districts if they think this is playing games to propose that we meet our obligations uh, in funding this aspect of our, of our edu kids' education. 
Mr. Chair. Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, and yeah, I also caught that line about playing games. I don't think this is playing games at all. This is living up to our commitments. We require them to do special education. We require them to provide English language learning. These are our requirements on the districts. This is us keeping a commitment. That's not playing a game. And your own district, I think it said, their, <coughs> their current projected shortfall for next year, 5.7, 5.8 billion million dollars. That's, that is a reality. You're saying we're throwing money at a problem. No, we're living up to our commitments. This is not throwing money at a com problem. If you commit you're gonna give me something and then you back away from it, then somebody else saying, well, you should live up to your commitment. That's not a game. And I really think when you look at, if you want to have people teaching literacy, the best thing to do is not have budget deficits where you have to lay off the people you want to do the teaching. To me, this is the opposite of playing games. And I, I guess I see a real problem with that terminology because I think our education system is a lot more important than that. And, and I, as one who agrees with you on the importance of the literacy, I just don't see how we can say it's okay for these districts all to have huge budget deficits, have to lay off teachers, and somehow say we're making a step forward because we're putting some teachers through an ed a literacy training program which um, shows a lot of promise. So I'm glad you want to do that, but I, I don't see how you can say that this is okay to not address these other needs. And this is something that's been festering for a long time. Um, we can point to the federal government for its failure to fund its mandates. We have the same, we have stronger mandates here and we're not living up to them. And, um, and I, I just don't see how you can argue that this is anything other than living up to our commitments, which is the first thing we ought to do when we have money available to live up to our commitments. One last comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead, Senator. Yeah, so for years again, Problems have been ignored. They've been, uh, they haven't been found for a lot of reasons. But if, but this is disingenuous because it's a tax increase. You're going to have to increase taxes because if you don't resolve the underlying problem, this cost is going to be three billion in three years. It's going to be four billion, five billion. Uh, they'll never, you'll never go back and address it. Is there a challenge out there? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a problem out there. But uh, this will be a tax increase. Vote yes on this. This is a tax increase because you're not going to be able to sustain this. It'll just continue to grow. But if you vote for a literacy, uh, a literacy uh, omnibus bill, you'll start to reduce special ed costs. So uh, this is a bad idea. It doesn't get at the root cause of the problem and uh, it's a tax increase. Thank you for your indulgence. Senator Kent. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you. I don't, uh, I, I kind of don't know what to say about that. Um, I've just heard that unfunded mandates are fine unless, and, uh, and you're assuming that it would require a tax increase to fund this. Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, it'd be nice if we had real targets and we could evaluate looking out into the out years how the finances of all of our budgets uh, would play out. We're all just shooting in the dark here at this point. Um, but these are important services that our kids need, that our workforce needs for the future. We require them and we don't fund them. So the solutions are either for the school districts to continue to raise local property taxes to make up the difference, or to subsidize them out of their general funds as they currently do. Uh, and that apparently is okay. Um, or maybe we should just get rid of those mandates and, and not provide these badly needed services uh, that are increasingly needed by our kids. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little amazed at what was just said here. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, you know, I, I go back a couple of years um, looking at special ed. We, we took a deep dive on this in 2018 um, and found 
a number of these mandates that were low value and um, expensive. And when we tried to save the average special ed teacher 40 hours a year per student, think about that, 20 weeks if, if the teacher has uh, effectively 20 students in her class um, would be significant. And yet we couldn't get some of that done. And this was coming to us from special ed administrators and teachers. And it was opposed by those who just want more money. They don't want to get rid of the mandates. They just want more money, even when they're low-value mandates. And so the other piece that came up during that conversation was that there needs to be a holistic look at how we fund special education, that there's no control on the costs that we have. I've heard from multiple school districts when somebody open enrolls that they have no ability to go in and talk about transportation costs or services. They're just billed for it. Um, I think this is a premature amendment um, and agree with Senator Champion that, um, or I'm sorry, Senator Chamberlain. Sorry, sorry, Senator. I want to trade spots. Uh, <laughs> Uh, agree with Senator Chamberlain that um, uh, we do need to have, this would be a, a huge tax increase, and we do need to have a more comprehensive look at, at special education, both uh, on the mandate side and the cost containment side. I don't think anybody's suggesting that we stand behind unfunded mandates. We've tried to get rid of some of the unfunded mandates. And that's actually one of the ways we should be attacking this. So uh, I'll be voting no against the, uh, on the Marty Amendment. Thank you, uh, Senator Marty. And then we should. Thank move on. you, Mr. Chair. And, and again, the putting thirty million dollars into literacy is a good thing, and I, I support that. I, I fail to believe that what Senator Chamberlain is saying. If we do those things, that's the root cause. We won't have special ed costs or the need for special ed cost subsidy. We won't have to English language learning. Literacy is going to be helpful. But we're not going to be helpful if we're laying off teachers at every school in the state. We're not going to be helping them if we do that. And we frankly are putting ourselves up in a situation where most districts are going to be doing that. And the special education cost subsidy, I don't know if you're not talking to superintendents, if you're not talking to teachers, if you're not talking to parents and PTAs, if you're not talking to people and hearing this is a huge problem. They could help fund some of the mental health if they didn't have to pay for the cost subsidy because we failed to fund our mandates. And um, I, Senator Chamberlain, if you say it's going to be higher numbers in the future, yes, that's because we have more need out there. And, um, and somehow or another suggesting that by doing the literacy, the little literacy package here, that that's going to address these shortages. I. I I think you should talk to school board members. They're elected officials. Talk to them. See what they're hearing. I don't think you're going to find, you're not going to find them saying that this isn't a problem, that this is not something the state should live up to its commitment on. This is our commitment. And it does not require a tax increase. We have lots of money in the budget this year, and we're still debating how we allocate it. And I would argue that this is a lot smarter thing to do than being giving huge tax cuts to some high-income folks. Again, this the amount that top-income folks are getting from your tax cuts are far more than we're putting into literacy here, but the districts are going to be laying off people. They're not going to be able to do the teaching if we're laying off people. This bill would address that, and, and this is, as I said, this is a state commitment. We've committed this. Senator Pratt says he might want to get rid of some of these mandates, but, you know, they're mandates the state has put on the districts. And he's not proposing to eliminate them now. He's saying, well, then we, in effect, have to say, we mandated this on our districts. We're not going to pay for it. And I understand we haven't paid for it some years. We've got the budget now to do it. And this is the time we have to make the decision. If we don't do it this year, when are we going to address this? OK, members, um, Senator Marty moves the A39 amendment. He's requested a roll call. Please take the roll. Chair Rosen. Vice Chair Ingebrigtsen? No. Senator Marty? Aye. Senator Benson? No. <coughs> Senator Champion? Aye. Senator Johnson? No. Senator Kent? Aye. 
Senator Kiffmeyer? No. Senator Lopez Franzen? Aye. Senator Pratt? No. And Chair Rosen? On a vote of five, no. Four, yes. The amendment is not agreed to. Members, any further amendments or discussion? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and just kind of taking a look that there are no other amendments. I'd like to. Uh, oh, there is. There is. A, oh, oh, there will be. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll hold my question, Mr. Okay. Chair. Senator Kent, did you have a minute? Oh, I'm sorry. What's the present? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I have the A40 amendment. Sorry, the 39, sorry. No, we just did the 39. No, we just did the 39. The 41, A41, I apologize. Senator Lopez Friends then offers the A41 amendment. Members? Yeah, and I believe everybody now has it. Is it online? It's not yet online, but go ahead. Thank Senator, you, Mr. You. Chair and members. And I've been listening to the debate about this education omnibus bill and what's in it and what's not. Uh, and I've heard different terms of talking about symptoms and diseases and game playing and low value, all negative aspects of language that we should probably not bring into when we're trying to talk about education, when we're trying to bring a positive bill forward to support our children and our kids and our families all over Minnesota. Uh, this amendment is the governor's education budget proposals members. It is a bill that has not received a hearing in the education committee. We've talked about piecemeal uh, approaches on education and bills traveling on their own when, in fact, this is what's being discussed as the omnibus bill. And we only see a part of what is a fundamental issue in, in learning, obviously. Uh, I myself have a five and a six-year-old. My six-year-old is in first grade. He's having trouble reading. His last uh, student parent-teacher conference, uh, they asked me if I wanted to consent to some support, which obviously we did. I spent every evening reading books to my kiddos and now especially trying to support him in his reading. And he is in one of the best school districts, arguably, in the entire state and country. So members, reading is part of the issue but as we all know, and those of you who are parents, we know that all of our kids are different and they have different needs. They come from different families. I don't think I'm a bad parent because my kid does not read at six years old, but I am working with him to make sure that he does. And I am thankful for the teachers that he has, for the literacy specialist that he has now uh, in addition to his daily routine. Uh, mind you, he is in an immersion program where they're teaching him two languages, not just English, in a public school in our state. Members, when we talk about treating symptoms and underlying diseases, I don't think I'm talking about my child, Mr. Chamberlain, Senator Chamberlain. I, I think we're talking about kids who well, have Mr. needs. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm going to take umbrage. Mr. Excuse me, excuse Mr. Me. Chair, gonna, I am I'm not I'm done with my comments. I'm going to take umbrage by you implying anything other. Senator Stick Chamberlain. Stick to the facts. Mr. Chair and Senator Chamberlain, I am not done. I did not interrupt your testimony. Let Senator me finish Lopez, mine. friends, and to the amendment. What I'm trying to communicate here is when I talk about children, I don't see them as a negative phrase of game playing. We're not playing games. We're trying to bring the best ideas to the floor, to committee. My amendment has not been heard in the Committee of Education of Jurisdiction. I want to talk about education holistically and not just tackle one part of the issue that has merit but is also not the fundamental problem as I think has been characterized. 
and we can go back to the record because those are the words I literally wrote on my sheet. We're not playing games. I want to make sure that our kids in every part of a state has the tools they need to succeed. One piece of the puzzle does not solve it. And the amendments that my members and colleagues have brought today are part of a holistic approach to learning. And if we had had the opportunity to hear these bills in the Committee of Jurisdiction, I think you've heard, you would hear from other parts of the state where we would agree that some of these aspects and ideas have merit as well. So members, this bill, this amendment strikes um, the suspension of the world's best workforce and retains $30 million for the letters training and proposes the governor's supplemental budget for education fu funding. That is, um, I'm sure already I, I can share that number if Mr. Nauman wants to fact check, but it is a cost of $790.4 million this biennium. It increases the general education formula by 2%. It increases uh, funding for early learning scholarships, which um, I know that we referenced Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi has the um, some provisions in, in their law and their supports for early learning that are not presently in Minnesota. They actually have home visiting programs. They fund home visiting programs at a larger extent than we do. Uh, child care tax credits and the affordability of child care. So that's even before we go to school. That's what Mississippi does. They have a great uh, model that I actually have a bill in Minnesota for years to provide tax credits for parents, teachers, and they also fund a similar program to CCAP, which is the the child care assistance program. So members, what I'm trying to allude here is that a lot of learning happens before we end up in the classroom. And preschool, uh, where one of my children is, is one of my kids is currently, um, he is getting education and it's not child care, but it does flow into a continuum of care that we need to make sure that we address in, in when we talk about education and when we try to compare uh, the great state of Minnesota with the great state of Mississippi. In fact, Minnesota is the most expensive, um, the number third in the country uh, for childcare at $16,000 a year. Mississippi is $5,400 um, a year. So teaching does not begin in the classroom. Education is more than just reading. We need to support all aspects. I, I want to uh, support my, my colleagues who are looking at mental health support, counselors, uh, when you talk to teachers, when you talk to people in the profession. And in fact, I have a neighbor who is a teacher herself. And when I was talking about literacy uh, for my child, um, she made a comment that there's literacy specialists, that she was not a literacy expert or, or specialist. And, um, you know, not every teacher teaches the same subject matter, and we need to make sure that we are, in fact, equipping all of our teachers with, with what they need to, to help our kids succeed. And, and I'm not saying anything negative about this letters training and whatsoever. We need kids to read that it's absolutely part of, of that experience. Uh, what I am saying is that we need to look at it holistically, and the governor's education budget proposal has a lot of merit. It, uh, it also includes student support personnel. It includes public pre-K for eligible four-year-olds. It includes a school-based mental health screening, increased funding for Grow Your Own, recruit and retain education support professionals. It also includes the reduction of special education cross subsidy, which has been an issue that in the decade I've been here, I, I have not stopped hearing from districts talking about that. And that is indeed only growing after the pandemic. Um, reducing uh, English lang language learner cross subsidy and a multi-tiered system of support. Uh, members, we can't treat education in a silo from the rest of, of what uh, goes into uh, creating a, a civil human being who will contribute to our tax rate into the betterment of our state. Uh, we have to make sure that these kids also have supports and their parents have support. So members, I think this bill uh, in the governor's proposal and the amendment I am just uh, putting forward uh, goes a long way to talking about the entire um, menu of options that we have in education to support them in a time when we have a record surplus, in a time where we can say uh, we're investing more in kids than we are on tax breaks. So members, I think uh, people will know 
uh, that their taxes might go up at the local level if we don't do our part at the state level to support education. So with that, members, I ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Um, Mr. Nauman, would you remind the committee what the cost of the uh, bill before us and what the cost of this would be? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, as Senator Franzen indicated, the amendment, the A41 uh, amendment, represents the governor's recommendation, and that uh, was priced at $790.4 million in fiscal year 23 with a tail of about 1.7. So the total price over three years is $2.5 billion. Senator Benson. Mr. Chair. I'm Mr. sorry, Chair. Senator. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to be sure I got that number right. So, um, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, the price of the governor's recommendation, the contents of this amendment, um, $790 million in general, um, general fund expenditures in fiscal year 23. The tail is $1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. So that's in fiscal years 24 and 25. It's roughly even in both years. There's about a $10 million difference in 24 and 25. So the three-year number is $2.5 billion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Franzen, could you clarify, you said that Mississippi does have early childhood visiting and we don't? Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Pre uh, Chair and Senator Benson, Senator no, we do Lopez have, Franzen. thank you, we do have some home visiting. Uh, they just have a, a newer, more enhanced program than we do as much as they have a more enhanced child care tax credits that um, we don't. So they, they have upped us uh, uh, in the game on when it comes to those two issues. Um, so Mr. Senator Chair, Benson. for the benefit of the committee, we use an evidence-based model um, and fund it at $22 million. Okay, members, any, any further discussion? Senator Chamberlain. Um, to the amendment. Yeah, no, uh, for obvious reasons. This is filled with mandates, and it, in fact, it increases, the re, our bill removes a mandate. This removes that removal. It puts the world's best workforce mandate back in, plus adds other mandates, um, uh, no members. Members, any other further discussion? Seeing none, um, Senator Lopez Franzen renews her motion to the A41 amendment. Um, she's requested a roll call. Please call the roll. Chair Rosen. Vice Chair Ingebrigtsen. No. Senator Marty. Aye. Senator Benson. No. Senator Champion. Aye. Senator Johnson. No. Senator Kent. Senator Kiffmeyer? No. Senator Lopez Franzen? Aye. Senator Pratt? No. Chair Rosen? Senator Kent? Aye. On a vote of four yes and five no, the amendment is not agreed to. Members, any other amendments or discussion? See, Senator um, Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief. We've had a long conversation today. Um, but, you know, as we're winding up our process with these bills here in the Finance Committee, I keep thinking about the public safety bill and $45 million for aircraft for the state patrol, which I think we all generally think is a good idea. We want to make sure they have the tools they need. And we're here today spending just $30 million on our schools when our kids are in crisis. And, uh, you know, we know as Senator Marty alluded, because the Association of Metropolitan School Districts did a survey of the metropolitan districts and that there are significant shortfalls and layoff notices will be going out in a matter of weeks. 
Uh, I also hear that the similar survey has been conducted by uh, Minnesota Rural Education Association, um, and that's still being compiled, but the, what I hear is that these are not just metro problems. These are problems for our districts across the state. And we have an opportunity to really step up in this moment and meet long-standing shortfalls within our education system that fail our students, that failed our students before a pandemic, but that now has become significant to those kids. And one of the things, like I said, I got into this as a parent advocating for education. And I remember coming to, uh, uh, well, it wasn't this building, but the one across the street, um, both of them, and meeting with my elected representatives. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how when we're dealing with our kids, we can't just study a problem forever and think that's okay. Our kids only get to be eight years old once. And we've, we've got to meet them where they are in that time. And we have that opportunity. And I just, I think, again, nothing wrong with the, the proposal for literacy from Senator Chamberlain. It just doesn't go anywhere near far enough to meet the challenges that our schools are facing. So um, I, I just all, I mean, from the absolute bottom of my heart, I just believe that we need to do so much better. And I really, really hope that by the time we're done with this session that we, um, that we do so much better for our students. Thank you, Senator Kent. Senator Morty. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I do support the 30 million in the bill for the literacy. I think that's a step, a good step. But it's, it's overwhelmed by the fact that the districts are gonna be laying off the people who are supposed to be teaching them. It's overwhelmed by the fact that they're struggling to provide mental health and other services for students. It's overwhelmed by all the other things we're failing to do. And again, this is a year when we'd have the ability to do so. We have ongoing funds available in the budget to do this. If we say we prioritize education, we prioritize our kids' learning, we talk about what a good investment in the future is, apparently this bill doesn't. This bill clearly doesn't. And I understand when you've got these budget targets that I haven't seen and none of us have seen in the least transparent system I've found yet, that the priority seems to be certain tax cuts rather than education. And again, here there are $30 million in the bill. I think we've had um, just funding the special education cost subsidies would have been multiple, multiple times that, but that's what the schools need. They need the literacy and funding to do everything. So I'm voting no, despite my support for 30 million dollars, because frankly, um, all of our districts are gonna be a whole lot worse off next year, even with this funding, because it's, it's like a drop in the bucket. Thank you, Senator Marty. Uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and before I make some comments, um, I would like to just ad address a quick question to Senator Chamberlain. Senator um, Chamberlain. And, and he and I talked about this yesterday. I'd like to, to talk about performance measures on uh, 2.17. And Senator Chamberlain, maybe you can talk about student performance on third grade reading proficiency assessment as measured by statewide or locally adopted reading assessments. And, I'm concerned that the MCAs are really the only uh, measurement we have tied to the state standards and they're consistent from school to school. Can you maybe talk about this change and, and the direction you're going with, with this proposal? Senator Chamberlain. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt. As you noted, the MCAs don't go away. The, um, in sub two, in that same paragraph, uh, I believe that's where it was. <coughs> you still have to follow um, Fed guidelines, uh, the reading proficiency goal on the first page. They had to follow Fed guidelines. I believe that's where it was, or that same paragraph. So they still have to take the MCAs. Um, and I agree with that. A lot of people don't like, who likes a test? But 
the MCAs give us a, a way to measure and compare. I think they're legitimate and necessary. But in the same area, we like to try to give some local control and ability to innovate at the local level. And there are places that works. And that's kind of how we were getting at this. Uh, kind of working different things, seeing what works, maybe something pops up that does, maybe it doesn't. But we still, they still required to take MCAs. This is just another attempt to try to involve some innovation and give some flexibility to the districts in what they're doing. Is it 100% necessary to have that language in there? No, but it was just in that same vein of local independence and innovation and that sort of thing. But they'd still have to take the MCAs for measurement. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Senator Chamberlain. I, I agree. I think schools do have the ability to uh, to do locally uh, as, as local assessments. My concern is that when we have reporting at the state level and we have the workforce or, or the world's best workforce literacy component still here, that we could have um, two different measures being reported. Um, and, and, and if you're open to it, Senator uh, Chamberlain, I'd, I'd like to continue to work with on this on this section. I thought we had a, a good conversation yesterday, uh, Mr. Chair. I you know I want to thank Senator Chamberlain for bringing this bill. Uh, as it's been mentioned, this is the most important thing that we can do for our students today. A few years ago, I had a, a, a literacy bill, and at the time, we said one third of our students weren't reading at grade level by third grade. You know, even, even before the 2021 school year, we were down to 55%, according to Senator Ch uh, Chamberlain's uh, uh, chart. And I think that's, we're, we're going in the wrong direction. And Senator Chamberlain has been a staunch advocate for literacy since I've been in the Senate. And I've appreciated his work and, and the thoughtfulness that goes into this, into this bill. And, and so, Mr. Chair, I will uh, wholeheartedly support Senator Chamberlain's uh, initiatives here. Um, I can't think of anyone in the Senate who's done more work uh, ensuring that our kids have the basic, the most important skill that they need in order to be successful in the classroom and focusing our efforts on the students, um, I think is paramount to make sure that they are successful in the classroom. So. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Then we'll go to Senator Benson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Nauman was able to get an answer for me. And I, before I make my comment, I'd like to ask Mr. Nauman again to confirm the information about the ESSR federal money on Mr. mental Mr. health. Mr. Nauman. So, Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, I believe you were interested in the um, the so-called ESSER funds mm -hmm. and whether mental health was an eligible use, and indeed it is. Okay. Senator Kiffmeyer? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to confirm that, and those funds are available to 2024 and can be used for those purposes. So appreciate that. As a matter of fact, Mr. Chair, um, uh, Minneapolis School District got, I think, the largest amount of the money. I um, hear about that a lot from my school district because it was run through the categorical per pupil formula. Therefore, my school district got a great deal less per pupil than uh, cities like uh, or like school districts like Minneapolis. But nevertheless, I just wanted to again uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Chamberlain, for this bill and its focus on literacy. And members, if there's one thing We've got to focus on, I think Senator Pratt said it so well, the numbers are actually going down and we've got to reduce this trend. And I think the um, most important job of the schools in regards to education really has to do with fundamentally that foundation of reading what this bill does. And reading also does other things. When you can read, it lifts your self-esteem in a genuine, true way. Because when you can read, you can do other things and that lifts their self-esteem and their mental health. It gives them a better life outlook. They can see a future. When they can read, they can understand and have a future. 
and that life outlook also is good for their mental health and all kinds of things. Their behavior often improves when they can read because they can focus on issues and they can uh, have some um, expansion in regards to where their life is going because they can read. And children very often, especially younger kids, when they're having struggles, they act out. It's their nonverbal way of saying, I'm struggling. When they can read, they have that outlook on life that also helps them in their behaviors. And I want the kids to really feel better about where they're at based upon the real core sense of reading and factual basis for that. Not just feeling better to feel better, but feeling better because they sense that they have the opportunity to succeed in life. Reading, most any child will recognize uh, those core assets in regards to them and their future. And so thank you, Senator Chamberlain. In my time in the Senate, I've recognized your singular focus and your care and love for the kids and the fundamental part of it in regards to reading and literacy in general as a building block. And without that foundation, everything else becomes very, very shaky. So I will gladly support and vote for this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Benson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just struck by a couple of things. You're only eight year old once, but you're only six year old, six years old and only seven years old once. And if you were in the St. Paul Public Schools, you were not in school for a year, and then you were masked for a year. So if you're a kindergartner, your ability to learn was severely compromised unless your parents moved you to a different school. That different school, that move to a different school is probably why schools have declining funding because parents were choosing to get their kids out of schools that were not teaching them basic things. If you were six years old, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, you were seven years old by the time you got back into your classroom in many of our schools. And then you were eight years old by the time your mask was off. And if we look at the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment of third grade reading scores, I think that reflects some of the incredible stress our kids were under. Yes, mental health stress was a real issue. Learning was a real issue. And there were schools across the country and around the world that were open. Senator Chamberlain, thank you for taking a very specific approach to helping our kids catch up so that they can get back on track. Looking at something that is absolutely foundational that will serve them well for the rest of their lives. What happened to our kids over those two years, six, seven, and eight years old, and all the other ages, is something that, thank goodness, Senator Rosen and Senator Draheim have mental health supports in the mental health bill. But they are going to need to catch up on reading. And Senator, thank you, and I will happily vote yes on the ways that you are supporting these kids. Seeing no further discussion, Senator Benson, would you move the bill? Mr. Chair, I'll move Senate File 4113 as amended be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. Senator Chamberlain for some final remarks. May I thank you for indulging me for maybe another 20 minutes, I'm kidding, maybe one minute or something. Um, so uh, thank you for the discussion, members. Thank you for the comments. Appreciate it. I, I should start by saying that parents drove this. Parents drove this. Starting in 2013, you've heard the story before, and I won't go through it again, but they drove it. They started it. They found the problems. They helped us. I'm simply a messenger and a conduit for their frustrations and their challenges over the years. It's all. They've had little breakthroughs over the years, getting things in statute. Uh, last year was a big deal for parents, for kids, and educators. In the whole process, in the whole 10, 12 years here, we've never attacked the educators, never. But they were shortchanged by a system that wasn't doing its job. And because that system wasn't doing its job, hundreds of thousands of kids didn't learn how to read. Because a system 
failed the teachers. I would dare say if we had set aside politics and agendas and money and profit and power, we wouldn't be at the point where we'd have 55% of our kids reading at a grade level. There's been many iterations over the years and a lot of thousands of pages have been written into statute in Minnesota and federal. Created the federal department in 78, reading wars, uh, profiles and learning, on and on and on. We had uh, the Ventura tax, uh, property tax uh, proposal that was supposed to help solve the problem. In 2011, I think Senator Olson put in statute the science of reading is required for all elementary ed teachers. And a recent study and report showed that 74% of the higher institutions weren't giving that to the teachers. Thus the Pelsby point in the, in the bill here. Our teachers were shortchanged. We've had thousands of pages of, of uh, statute put in. World's best workforce. Well intended, I'm sure. But and it absolutely doesn't correlate with any success. It correlates with failure. Senator Benson mentioned uh, early ed. I'd be, members, I'd be happy to support all the money you want for early ed, for anything, for all those programs, if it showed that our kids were reading. But instead what happens is school districts and the department decide to lower the standards and number of credits you need for graduation. Instead of focusing and high increasing expectations, they say, we're not going to focus on reading as much to grade our schools. That's what they do. So if, maybe if we put aside all this other stuff and do what we all say we really want to do and address those children and help those educators, we wouldn't be where we're at today and doing this dance. The parents drove this and it's been a dogfight from the beginning to get the simplest things put in the statute. Yet in 2013, 2014, we added hundreds of pages for world's best workforce and on and on and on we go. If special ed was underfunded and ELL cross subsidies underfunded, well why wasn't that addressed years ago to fix it? If you want equality and equity and a real opportunity, you give the kids reading. A lot will grow from a mustard seed, right? You plant one little seed, a lot grows from it. This isn't Chamberlain's genius. These are parents who are concerned about their kids. These are educators who come to me and say, we need something different. And that's what I did. I listened to them. That's where we're at. We don't need thousands of pages. We don't need hundreds of more pages of uh, law and thousands of pages of rules and regs. The schools don't need to be burdened after two years of disruptions on our kids, as Senator Benson mentioned. We don't need more of that. We need to focus on the simple, pure cause of this. And I believe with collaborative work, bipartisan collaborative work, we've gotten to where we believe we need to be to get rid of that problem and fix it permanently without spending billions of dollars and creating thousands of pages of statute and more mandates. So thank you for indulging me, members. Uh, thank you for the discussion. Um, truly appreciate it. More importantly, the parents. And yes, there are educators out there who appreciate it and support these ideas as we relieve mandates and focus on the most important thing in recovering from two years of disruptions. Thank you very much. I took too much time. You're all saints. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain, for bringing this bill forward and also with uh, such passion. Senator Benson renews her motion to move Senate File 4113 as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign? No. no. The ayes have it. The bill is agreed to it, and we'll be moving to uh, general orders. Thank you very much. And members, uh, we're going to go into recess now until 1 o'clock.